The thing that really intrigued me was the discovery that at the foundation of life, and even the very simplest cells, we have this amazingly complex code. The DNA, we all learn about it in high school. We think that you know, we all learn about the double helix structure of the DNA molecule. But that's not the most important thing about it. It's that within that double helix, there is literally a code, uh, a digital information that is directing the construction of the important proteins and protein machines that every, cells, every cell needs to stay alive. Bill Gates has said it's like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever created. And I was doing, at the time, um, for the, the work as a geophysicist for an oil company, I was doing uh, uh, seismic digital signal processing, which was an early form of information technology. And I got fascinated with the idea that, that there was this, first of all, an impasse in evolutionary explanations of the origin of life. Nobody how we got, knew how we got from the chemistry in the prebiotic soup to the code in an actual living cell. Uh, but it, it was fascinating that the, the impasse was created by the mystery surrounding the origin of information. Where did that come from? And so uh, a year later, I was off to, to uh, grad school in England. I ended up doing a PhD in origin of life biology within a uh, history and philosophy of science de uh, department in, in Cambridge. And um, so that's kind of my a sketch of my journey and how I got interested in this. I saw in one of your previous interviews, you said that you were very interested in origin stories. And yeah. Me too. You know, that was the... Well, it's always interesting when you see someone who's kind of dedicated their life to a very specific thing. Like, where, what's the root of this? Where did it come from? So for you, you, you went through this funk and... Did you find comfort in religion? Is th is that what helped you? What? Did you find structure in it? I found answers to basic worldview questions that I thought were, as a 14-year-old, I thought nobody, you know, there must be something wrong with me. Nobody else is having these questions. I'm not talking to anyone at school who's worried about me. I think you're just smart. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I remember one day, I mean, just uh, total, re well, okay, for example, I was in this big leg cast, and I would crutch my way up to the to the uh, uh, up our driveway, get the newspaper, bring back the box scores to read, you know, about the baseball games the night before. And every day, it's a new date, and I do this, and a new date, and a new date, and I started thinking time is a really freaky thing. I can imagine an event, and you know, I'm going to lift this cup, I'm going to drop it, put it over there. Now, that event just took place, but it's already gone. We're not experiencing it anymore. We have a memory of it. But what does that actually mean? Where did uh, There was this flow of sensory experience, but there didn't seem to be anything rooting it that gave it a, a, um, an enduring reality. And I had this sense there must be something that doesn't change or else everything else that does change um, is passing, ephemeral, and, and ultimately of no account. And so, you know, you read, I, I ended up reading the big fat family Bible that I'd never cracked and uh, found that when God revealed his name to Moses, it was the I am that I am, this timeless, eternal person. And you found the same thing in the New Testament, the way Jesus Christ was referred to. Was, uh, and so I thought, I, w I wonder if there is something that doesn't change. And so it, the kind of philosophical questions that I was having made me want to explore whether or not a revealed religion might in fact be true. Can I ask you yeah. to expand on that? What do you mean by something that does not change? Um, some eternal self-existent reality, I guess. I, you know, it was not something as a 14-year-old I had worked out. It was a kind of an intuition that mm -hmm. there... Um, all I... It was the experience of having... Uh, the, 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 the constant flux of changing sense perceptions left me with a sense that uh, there was nothing solid to, to hold on to in reality. And, um, and so this, was, uh, this is not a great, you know, th th this is not the argument for the existence of God that I would re repose, in, in which I would repose great trust. I'm not trying to persuade anyone by this. I'm just telling what my experience was at this point. I later found what I think are very, very persuasive arguments, both philosophically and scientifically. The thing that really convinced me as a, as a university student doing, uh, studying philosophy was the, an argument known as the, the argument from epistemological necessity. 
the fundamental question in modern philosophy that has really just been a stumper and has led to this whole postmodern turn where people don't think there's no objective basis for any reality is the, is the question of the reliability of the human mind. On what basis can we trust the way our minds process all that sensory information? This goes back to, to, to Hume and Kant and some of the philosophers in the uh, Enlightenment period. And from that point forward, there was a great doubt. Maybe we can't trust our minds. Maybe we can't trust. Uh, we have all these things we assume about reality in order to make sense about reality. That every cause has an effect, for example. Um, but we can't prove those things. We have to use those assumptions in order to know anything at all. And the the I encountered this argument that su suggested, well, if if we try to justify our ability to know the the world around us by um, by empirical data by things we observe. This was Hume's argument. You can't do it. Uh, if we, we, uh, he was a radical empiricist and found that in order to make any sense of the, of the sense impressions he had, he had to presuppose the uniformity of nature. But to prove the uniformity of nature, he had to make reference to s sensory observations. And so he was arguing in a circle. And so it came down, you couldn't justify the reliability of assumptions we, the, the, we make in our minds by observing the world you had to use those assumptions to make sense of the observations. But if you presupposed that our minds were made by a benevolent creator who gave us those assumptions in order to make sense of the world that he also made, then there was a principle of correspondence between the way the mind worked and the way the world worked, in which case we could trust the, the basic reliability of the mind. And this turns out to be one of the key foundational assumptions that gave rise to modern science. It was called the idea of intelligibility. Newton, Boyle, Kepler, the great founders of modern science, thought that, they, that nature had secrets to reveal. There were patterns there to be revealed that we could understand because our minds had been made in the image of the same rational creator who had built rationality and design and pattern and lawful order into the world. 